implying there is, well, wait a minute. If I'm going to try to explain away everything in the Bible that uh, the Bible seems to present as a miracle, uh, as where, simply where a stop? yeah, where do you stop with that? And so um, I think a lot of I, and again, it's something I'm, I'm open to. I, I'm I'm I get someone looking at the Bible and saying, look, you've got all these miracles. I don't think miracles are possible, but I'm drawn to the Bible. And so therefore, I'm going to try to figure out what would be a scientific explanation for Jesus' resurrection. Well, and then that's where you get all those views of, well, hallucination would make the better sense of that from the, what I know in the world. A hallucination would make more sense than an actual resurrection. Um, the biggest problem with that view, to my way of thinking, is the, the straight-up denial of miracles. So if you're a Christian and you recognize that God created the universe out of nothing and that he exists, then you'd have to acknowledge that miracles are, by their very nature, possible. It's not that naturalism is true, therefore miracles are not possible. We know that supernaturalism is true. We know that God exists. We know that he, he's already done more, more grand miracles than you, know, you think about God's creation of the universe out of nothing and then compare it to the parting of the Red Sea and you go, well, the parting of the Red Sea is nothing compared to the things that we know and can kind of, in a sense, confirm that God has done. So why would I go to the parting of the Red Sea and say that couldn't have happened when I know that God exists and has the power to do the things? Go ahead. So where did the Reed Sea? I don't understand why he would, where would that come from? Just like that. I think it is just generated from I, now, I, I should be fair and say there may be more to it. I, I don't know. I, if you wanted me to and you sent me an email, I would do a little more digging. Is there some other textual reason to come up with that, something There's like that? There's a lot of place names in the Old Testament that have several different names. Yeah, several different names, and it, and it could be something like that. Um, my, my comment is why... Do I or anybody have to question God and his powers uh, and explain it with my puny mind? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's fair enough. Let's come back to that. But I, my, my sense is that most of those kinds of things come from just that sheer desire to say, look, how can I make the Bible seem more rational? And if I can explain to you why it should be rational to you, that maybe it'll make it more winsome to you. Speaking of, have you read, have you heard of Dennis Prager's The Rational Bible? No. Yeah. I, I haven't read it, but I've, Maddie's a huge Dennis Prager. Mm -hmm. He's a Jewish guy. Yep. So, yeah. Well, yep. I think all that stuff about rationalism and everything, that's putting God in a pretty small box. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if we have a God that created the world and the universe mm -hmm. and us, and uh, God is above physics and yeah. science. I yeah. mean, if he wants to change things, you know, mm -hmm. he's perfectly capable of it. And there's another thing, too. Uh, Young talked about the uh, theory of synchronicity, you know, which is pretty cool, too. Things happen at just the right time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so God is master of that also. We will be talking about that today. Yeah, I, I think the question of, you know, why should I question God or God is beyond my capacity to understand, you know, that's something we've hit on several times in here. And, and within this room, I think most of us have little problem with that, with that way of, of thinking about it, right? I, I recognize, uh, you know, one of the things we've all been indoctrinated in is, I think, a proper humility before God. <coughs> So we recognize that I'm, I'm not God. I couldn't possibly understand the things that God understands. And so when I run up against a, a difficulty, I, I can be actually pretty at peace with that without too much trouble. That's not equally true for everybody, and even in this room, okay? It's not equally true for each of us. Um, I think I have times when I probably st struggle with things that many of you probably don't, and, and vice versa. Um, one of the things we're trying to be open to, though, is, again, the, the people outside this room. Um, and m one of my tread lightly kinds of things is, if you go to that well too many times, then the, the non-believer 
is just not going to take your faith seriously enough to hear the gospel. If you just keep going, well, can't, it's a mystery, we can't understand it, God is God, we're not. It's a mystery, God is God, we're not. You know, if you're coming from the outside looking in, why, why would you take that seriously? All you're saying is you don't know a bunch of things. And in order to justify your ignorance, you're going to say it must be God, right? And I know that's hard to hear. But, that's my go-to. That's my go-to. <laughs> yeah, but for me personally, I try to use that as little as possible, especially when talking with non-believers. If I'm having a conversation with other believers, I'm perfectly happy to go there. Let's understand the, God's word as deeply as we can personally understand it, but let's recognize good humility in that we are not God. I think God has given us his word for us to understand. So one of the places where I really hate this, this tactic is when we use it to reference specifically the Bible. Okay? When we say the Bible is beyond our understanding because we're not God, I think that is super dangerous because God gave us the Bible for our understanding. I think it is understandable in context, with effort, um, and it, you should be really careful about saying, I don't know, it's, it's a mystery. Uh, I think some things in the Bible are hard to understand, but be careful about saying um, we can't understand it because we're not God. It's not written for God, it's for us. All right, let's get started just to make sure we get through all this. Um, so we've looked at this mountain of ev evidence that Christianity is true, um, but we look specifically at the New Testament, and I just uh, we want to keep coming back to this. Rem rem remember, we're not claiming that we gave all this evidence to argue someone into the kingdom. We're not claiming that you need an intellectual understanding of all this to be a believer. As Len has brought up many times, I believe it because the Holy Spirit has given me the gift of faith. That's, that's not, we're not talking about, I'm, I'm trying to convince you to have a rational reason to believe the things. Um, I think God has given us rationality. Jesus took away your sins. He didn't take away your brain. Uh, I think we are supposed to think about these things and try to understand them. Uh, but it's not an understanding of what's the right view of the Old Testament that saves me from my sin, right? That's, that's something I want to be careful about. We've also used the analogy of tearing down walls of objection for the non-believer. And for many people, a big brick or several bricks, several individual bricks, if you will, in the wall can be the Old Testament. It could be a moral issue over here. It could be um, some of the more fantastical miracles over here. It could be um, somebody using it with, to make bad theology that's maybe not consistent with the, with the rest of the Bible. It could be all kinds of problems. Um, and it's also a stumbling block to, I think, deep faith for, so you think about faith being that gift, that saving faith is a justification thing, a one, once and for all, boom, Jesus did it on the cross, but there's also sanctification, that spiritual growth that God is working all of, all through all of us. That is that, you know, that point where you get to often later in life where you have a, a an easier time trusting God because you've seen him at work longer than you had when you were 17. Um, and for some people, the stumble, it's, this is one of those things that keeps them from, from being able to, to fully trust. Many would prefer to discard it, and there are multiple grounds for doing that. Again, we mentioned one already. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, look at it, it just read some of the, the, the more uh, um, amazing accounts in Scripture. Tell me that um, God spoke to Balaam through his donkey. Like, why, why, why would I not read that in the same way that I would read Aesop's fables? It, it just, it's very similar in some senses to that. And for many of us, we say, well, because it comes from God's word. And so I'm just going to take it at face value. And yet, um, I'm just trying to help everybody understand why that's... Um, I don't know if I've told you this before, though. Whenever I bring up Balaam and his donkey, I have to tell a quote from Rich Mullins. Um, Rich, Rich Mullins says, uh, you know, keep in mind that God spoke to Balaam through his ass. 
So if you're ever you know hearing someone and you're st or you're starting to get a little a, a little um, uh, pompous about your own w wisdom biblically that kind of thing, God spoke to Balaam through his ass and he's been speaking through asses ever since. <laughs> That's, there you go, Pastor. Remember all that. The people said amen. <laughs> uh, some people prefer to discard the Old Testament because of, objection, uh, of objections to the moral code that they believe is only found there, which is in and of itself a, a, a misunderstanding of the Bible, but sometimes that's the problem. And then see here a belief that the New Testament represents a new covenant, which is, is certainly true, but the idea that it makes everything in the Old Testament obsolete is a misconception, okay? Uh, fairly recently, pretty famously, if you, if, you, if you travel the internet circles that I do, you saw uh, six months ago to a year ago the internet flood with controversy over a fairly famous pastor named Andy Stanley um, saying we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. There are other some other issues. Yeah, which is a shame because I I, I really like his dad. I like him. Yeah, for, yeah. I mean, he's done some good things. And, yeah. and and giving Andy a, a chance. So I've dug into this a little bit. Spent some time listening to him explain the things that people have plucked out of his sermons and and raised a big stink about. Um, he doesn't mean by this what it sounds like he means. Okay. When I heard this, like many people, I thought he was saying that we need to basically just tear it out of our Bible and ignore it or forget it or consider it not God's word. That's not what he would say. And I'm gonna explain in a minute what he, what he is saying, okay? Um, many other people looked at that at the time that this was all you know, kind of big news and said, unhitch from the Old Testament. I'm a Christian because of the Old Testament. So like John MacArthur said that, for example. Mike Winger, who's one of the guys I've really pushed on you, this really good uh, <coughs> biblical understanding on so many things, uh, running a lot of YouTube videos. Um, they would say, look, look at all this prophecy. Look at how Jesus can only, you know, only Jesus fulfilled all of these things uniquely in one person. You know, how could you just chuck that and and even have a full understanding of Christianity? So that's part of the picture here. There's a lot of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Yeah, tons the of it. Hebrews. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't understand a lot of what, if you don't understand the Old Testament, you don't understand what Paul was going through with, yeah. the, say, the Judaizers. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. I mean, if you literally got rid of the Old Testament, the New Testament would be almost nonsensical. There's a ton, you know, Jesus quoting from it over and over and over again. And, um, you know, you might be able to handle the quotes and not have a big deal, need to understand that he's quoting from the Old Testament. But there are other things that are, you know, you know, references to David or Abraham. And, you know, if you literally didn't have it at all, you'd be quite confused, I think. Um, so, in a sense, I think there's actually something... Uh, potentially valuable in, in both of the views that I just mentioned, even though you might not fully identify even with the second one. I'm a Christian because of the Old Testament. You might say, well, I don't know if I'd go that far. That's, that seems extreme. And I think even what Stanley said, once you know what he was saying, what, what he meant by it, uh, there's actually something to it, okay? Uh, in addition, we're going to look at these questions. Why is the Old Testament important at all? Um, can we verify it in the same way that we can the New Testament? Uh, do we have to believe all the accounts in the Old Testament literally happened? Is that required? Um, Kathy mentioned being sort of given a choice. Um, I think that probably if you're a lifelong LCMS person, you might feel like, well, I can't be an LCMS Lutheran uh, and believe something other than a literal understanding of the Old Testament. And I would say, I don't think that's exactly true, but uh, the, certainly the LCMS teaches a more literal understanding of the history of the Old Testament. And the reason why is because we think that when you look at the text, it becomes clear in context when it's figurative, and it becomes clear when it's not figurative. 
and we shouldn't take these historical events as figurative just because they're fantastic when the text itself reads like history, okay? And so that's, that's kind of a, a, a 30,000 foot overview, I think. And, and it's great to have the pastors in here today because um, I think this, this more than a lot of our topics could be helpful for you guys to chime in on. The LCMS website uh, says both of the Old and New Testaments are the Word of God, authored by the one and the same Holy Spirit. No one can discard either one without incurring the wrath of God. I thought that was pretty strong language. Um, certainly, maybe a key word there is discard, right? And so one of the things I find when people debate whether or not something should be taken literal in the, in the text is that very often we don't recognize that even within a single sentence, there are things in, in English, just normal speech, that are, you're, you're saying something literally, but you can use a figurative language sometimes to describe it. So if I say like a car is flying down the road, mm. am, I, am, I, am I speaking in parables? No, I'm, I'm talking about something that's literally happening but I am using a figurative wording to, mm. to communicate it, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times in scripture you find there's a, there's a more nuanced way to look at a lot, of, a lot of things. It goes on to say, essentially the two are the same in that they both contain, this, contain the same moral law and the same gospel message that sinners are saved uh, alone by grace in his son, the Messiah, who was to come, right? Um, I think that pr probably there'd be some debate about exactly to what extent the Old Testament points to the gospel since we think so much about animal sacrifice and, and uh, those kinds of things. But the Old Testament even has God saying things like, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. There's, there's even a clarification even in the Old Testament of those kinds of things. And we're gonna talk about why, why the sacrifice system is in the Old Testament. But why did Stanley, is that a hand up Cheryl? Huh? You were going like this. Yeah, God, I, I was just uh, I was thinking about this, and I think that it's like say if you uh, you're re reading like a trilogy, yeah. you know, like the three like the three uh, Hunger Games. Yeah. If you start reading the second hung, you know, Hunger Games, uh, yeah. book. Yeah. You don't really can't connect with what the first yeah. book said, and you're going, well, not how did this happen? You know. Yeah. And I kind of think look at it that way. Yeah. If that stuff you read in the New Testament does come from the old and you'd go well how does this fit in yeah you know one of the things that I had in the back of my mind as something that could be done in here on a, any day that I'm gone if, if we don't have other ways to, to fill the, the space is watch a video called the road to Emmaus for a long time we had the DVDs in here um, and um, I use it in class to explain to my students just what you just said. Um, what it does is it fictionalizes the, the, one of the appearances of Jesus on Easter uh, with the two uh, disciples, or not two of the twelve, but two disciples that are uh, in that sort of second circle of disciples for Jesus. He walks with them on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him until sort of the end of that account, right? And what it tells us is that Jesus sort of asked them questions about this Jesus guy they're talking about and that he goes on to explain to them the connection between the Old Testament and the events of, of his ministry and his uh, passion. Um, and what they do in the video is they, they then elucidate what that conversation might have been like. What, what kinds of things in the Old Testament might Jesus have explained to them to say? And it's, it's amazing, it's, it's, I think it's fantastic. I'm, I'm always a little bit nervous when you have a, a, de a depiction in fiction of the Bible because you don't have in the Bible a moment by moment description of what Jesus did and said and you have to fill in so much that you just, you're running some risks there. But, um, I think it's really great, and if we don't ever use it in here, I'm going to still recommend uh, that you check it out for that reason. Um, so um, here's what, he, what Stanley was saying. He, he's saying that our Christian faith does not hinge on the Old Testament. 
And as much as all of us are saying, there's actually so much in the Old Testament that is completely intertwined with the New Testament. Um, you'd still have to, I think, acknowledge it's true, right? It's, it's still accurate to say that my, my faith that saves me according to the New Testament is not a faith in the Old Testament, right? We don't have creeds that say, I'm saved by grace through knowing the Old Testament, right? Through, or through anything related to that, right? That's just, so, yeah, and so, that, and, and sometimes we, we Lutherans are, are accused of that for other reasons. But um, so to, to that extent, I would agree with them because I think this is one of the clearer passages in Scripture right here, right? The first Corinthians passage. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain, right? Paul is saying the, the resurrection is the key to all of it. And so... Uh, and then you have other passages that, that talk specifically about what we are to believe in um, uh, in terms of Jesus and his resurrection, that he died for your sins. And so in that literal sense, he's kind of right. If that's all he means by it, then uh, I'm somewhat on board with it. Um, others would even double down on this and say, look, you've got this new covenant thing. You have Jeremiah even prophesying that there would be this new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So there's this pointing to a, a new covenant, which we recognize is through Jesus and, and is about grace. Uh, another reason why someone might uh, some, that someone might use to justify viewing the Old Testament differently is because the historical aspects of it are not as testable as the historical aspects of the New Testament. So you can go through uh, the book that I've mentioned to you a couple of different times. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Has in it a list from Acts and from John specifically of historical factoid after historical factoid after historical factoid that have been now confirmed or verified by archaeology historians. Um, that's harder to do the further you go back. So that's just common sense, right? If I tried to verify for you multiple different ways something that happened yesterday, that's going to be easier than verifying something that happened a year ago. And that's going to be easier to verify than something that happened 10 years ago. And so if you were looking for that kind of a thing and you weren't willing to just take the Bible at face value, the Bible says it, um, I believe it, that settles it, right? If you wanted to have some confirmation, then it's just harder to get to. Now, that's not to say that there aren't a bunch of things. There are. There are. And it's really one of the more... Yeah, it's one of the more interesting things to keep an eye on if you, if you care to. Um, in terms of what every day is being discovered in the Holy Land that confirms different historical aspects of the Bible. One of my favorite ones that I did not know, of course, I grew up accepting that King David, well, I've mentioned this one before, um, accepting that King David was not only a real person, but did all the things that the Bible says he did and never even thought twice about it. Uh, you didn't need to show me any kind of extra biblical evidence for David. I didn't need it. I wasn't looking for it. But if you are, were a historian and you didn't consider the Bible itself to be enough, you could have said 15 years ago, we don't know if this David guy was even a real dude. We don't know if he existed. And since then, archaeologists have found extra biblical confirmation of David as an actual the house of David, the, ki the kingship of David uh, is out there. And it's really cool. It's just uh, constantly becoming uh, a, a bigger and bigger body of those kinds of things. We found evidence, too, that the, uh, my names are bad, that washed his hands. Um, Pilate. Pons, yeah. Mm -hmm. They found uh, That's that right. he I mean, we saw yeah. the stone. Yeah. That's fairly recent, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, I was there in 12. So. Yep, yep, good. Good, good, good. One of the really popular ones right now is Exodus. 
you probably might have seen advertisements for different um, movies and whatnot um, promoting a historical view of the Exodus. One of the most popular things to do for historians is to deny the Exodus because of alleged lack of evidence. And so the more evidence that pops up, the harder it is for them to just flat deny that it happened. Uh, but um, they'll do it. They'll still do it. They'll, they'll just keep because it kind of comes in piecemeal. So they go, oh, and th that means this or that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, th w this, this is way too far in the weeds for most of you, I, I assume. But one of the things I've been interested in lately is the dating of the Exodus. <coughs> so the traditional view to date the Exodus is in the 15th century BC. And um, <coughs> according to some sources I've been looking at lately, there's much better evidence for it being in the 13th century BC. And the reason why I'm even mentioning it is, what's interesting about that is, if you were, if you were looking in the wrong place, so to speak, archeologically, then you'd have more of a view, well, it must not have happened at all, because we're, we're looking in the 15th century as far as like layers of archeology, span not finding the evidence we ought to find, but if you were looking in the right time frame, um, more evidence uh, pops up. And so some really interesting things about that. If you're interested in that, let me know. I'll send you a couple of things I've been looking at lately. That's been a long controversy on that. Yeah, for sure. Number 15 on here, there are two main reasons uh, I mentioned because they're older. That's just common sense. And the second thing, a little bit more controversial, but um, there, there's, once you start to learn about Hebrew culture and, and ancient Near Eastern culture in general, uh, you, you start to learn that the way they use language isn't the way we think of language. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty stark thing to kind of, once you start to realize it and study it, it's, it's kind of interesting. It pops up a little bit in, in Revelation, so I'm going to use that as, as my best example of this. Okay, so. Um, the, uh, the reference to 144,000 in heaven it, that the Jehovah's Witnesses cling to for a long time, claiming only 144,000 people would literally be in heaven, uh, or this reference to a thousand year reign in Revelation. Um, there's much, much better reason to understand both of those numbers as a number that means completeness than it does a literal set of, uh, of years or people. And there's a whole case to be made for that if you're interested in it. Um, uh, I don't know that I would spend a whole class period on it. There, I, I don't feel like I'm an expert on it at all, but I think I've learned enough to know, oh yeah, there, there you have that and there you have that. And so when you understand that as being a heavy usage in the further back you go in ancient Hebrew, you start to see, well, wait a minute, some of the things that, that people have done with dates and whatnot you know, like 480 years is a reference to um, how long um, uh, one of the time periods is in the Old Testament. And there are lots of uh, scholars who would say, yeah, that, that never was written to be a literal 480 years. It was meant to represent a time period. I'm not necessarily saying they're 100% right. I'm just saying that there are scholarly arguments on this. And so it's one of the reasons why I couldn't go to the Old Testament and say, let me prove Christianity to you by showing you all this evidence that the Old Testament is true in the way that I think we successfully did with the New Testament. That's really all I'm trying to say. So yeah. are you saying the number 144 represents completeness? Yeah. You, yeah. Think and about that number specifically. Com yeah, specifically. Can you send me more? I have cousins who sure. are JDEF. And, and, so yeah, and so this, this, to give you just a quick overview of that, what it has to do with, you have the 12 tribes of Israel. What's 12 times 12? 144. 144. That's completeness. What's uber completeness? Multiply that number, right? And you, hmm. like this, right? And so there's a whole view of Revelation that goes through, and this is related to something called gematria, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, um, yeah, if you, if you help me remember, I'd be happy to send you some resources. Continuing on. So uh, are these good arguments to dismiss the Old Testament? Is there some reason that we should hold it in high regard? And I think the Trump answer on this is, let's, let's find out what Jesus thought. 
Okay? <laughs> Jesus is my Savior. I know that he rose from the dead. I know he paid for my sins. I know he's God in the flesh. If I want to try to understand how I should understand the Old Testament, I want to know how Jesus understood the Old Testament during his earthly ministry. Um, so the best reason we have for a high view of the Old Testament is Jesus. He had a high view of the Old Testament, and, and I'm going to show this to you. Um, in this, so in this way, we have this mountain of evidence that we can trust that Jesus is who he says he is. Um, that, be, that, in a sense, becomes an evidential reason to, to believe the Old Testament. Does that make sense? So if you have this good evidence to trust in Jesus, and I, again, I'm gonna, I get that many of you would say, I don't need any evidence that I can trust in Jesus. I just believe it. Okay? But if you have all this good evidence that you can trust in Jesus as being who he, he is, who he says he is, then his view of the Old Testament is also then kind of confirmed by that evidence. Okay. Um, one of the clearest ways to see the high view that Jesus had of the Old Testament is to see how often he used it to support his teaching. Right. One of his favorite sayings during his earthly ministry was, "Have you not read? Is it not written? <laughs> you know, like you want the answer to this question? Seriously, just look at your Bible. Like mm -hmm. that's that's how he answered people um, many many times." Uh, a couple of examples of this in Mark 12, he says, As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? Uh, in Luke 6, he answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? In Matthew 19, have you not read that he who created them uh, from the beginning made them male and female? So this is just a routine go-to for Jesus. And right away, as, a, as a, a true Christian who trusts in Jesus and in the gospel, we should go, okay. I get it. I get it right now. I can see Jesus viewed the Old Testament as authoritative. Now, whether or not that would be confirmation that, say, the Jonah account is literal, that's maybe a different question, but it, this is the more important question, that Jesus saw it as authoritative. Um, we'll come back to the other issue in a second here. Uh, any guesses? This is not on your sheet. How many times Jesus quoted from the Old Testament? 700 a bunch. <laughs> a bunch, a bunch. It's around 80. It's around 80 separate quotations. I've seen 84. I've seen 78. And, and the only reason why that number varies is because there are some times when Jesus uses just a half a line from the psalm, that kind of thing. And you could say, well, you know, is that really a quote from over here? You know, you could, you could debate a couple of them. But um, <coughs> which book did he quote from the most? Isaiah. Psalms. Isaiah, Psalms. Any other guesses? It's Psalms. Um, which the, the first time I heard that, I thought, oh, wow, maybe I should go back to Psalms and, and be, maybe be a little bit more uh, care, careful in my reading of it. Then I also realized, you know, it's long. <laughs> so, so the reason why he quotes it the most might not be it's the most authoritative Bible in the Old Testament. Not that there's any difference in the, in the authoritativeness, but you understand what I'm saying. Um, I, uh, so that's interesting. One of the most significant foreshadowings or prophecies that Jesus makes about himself uses one of the most fantastical accounts in the Old Testament to make his point, right? He says, but he answered them. They're asking for a, a sign, right? He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he makes this reference to Jonah being in the, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so will the son of man. <coughs> um, so there's this, um, it's kind of interesting to think, okay, well, wait a minute. What are you doing there, Jesus? I thought that Jonah thing was just fiction. Why are you making this connection to this literal thing that you're going to do in your death and resurrection? Now, I'm not saying this is definitively, like, you could, I think you could still, this is probably blasphemy in the LCMS, I think you could still go to Jonah and say, look, this is a story that's meant to point to Jesus, but not, that doesn't necessarily mean it literally happened. Okay? Now, I'm still going to make the case that I think it literally happened, but I'm just saying, it, I wouldn't want you to say, I reject Christianity because I can't buy into the historical account of Jonah. I think that would be unwise. I think that would be not, not needed, not useful thing to do. 
But clearly Jesus is referring to Jonah as important. Right? This is this is something again, he's he's making this connection. So did Jesus believe, and by the way, I left out a word on your sheet, so that sentence isn't gonna make any sense unless you add the word did. Uh, so um, did Jesus, I put it in the wrong place on the screen now that I think about it, did Jesus believe or teach uh, that Jesus, Jonah, really spent three days in the belly of a fish? Here's what I think we can say definitively. He paralleled his own literal resurrection from the dead with Jonah. I mean, that's just basic, that's just obvious, right? And he never gave us any reason to think of it as a parable. There isn't, there isn't any other than the fact that it is a fantastical, seemingly unscientifically possible thing, there isn't any other good reason that I've read to say, let's take it as something other than history. So I think of Jonah as a literal prophet in history. I think of him as literally going to Nineveh and having this job to do in Nineveh. Uh, and I even take the, the fish thing as literal um, because I know miracles are possible and I haven't yet seen a good reason other than it being a miracle to reject it as history. Thoughts about that? Pastor, go ahead. You know, I met with a Catholic priest back in the 90s when I was in my 30s doing city ministry in St. Louis, just wanted to get to know clergy in the area. And this was brought up, and he subscribed to the historical critical way of looking at Scripture, did not believe that this was a true actual account of what mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. He tended to see it more in what, how you're describing it as pointing to Jesus, yeah. but it did not literally happen. Yeah. So what do you do with Jesus actually quoting it in the book right. of Matthew? He didn't have much to say, but he still kind of worked his way through. Uh, yeah. more of a, I think uh, you could still have Jesus quoting, you know, referencing it and, and, and still not being literal. I don't think that necessarily is a deal breaker. And, and if I'm talking to somebody who says, yeah, I just can't buy into this Jonah thing, I say, okay, yeah. all right. Would you say the same thing about creation? What if you don't buy into the way... Genesis describes and how we understand the creation. Because people are, can I still be a believer in Jesus, go to heaven, but not believe the Genesis account of the creation? My response is the same response that we've been saying all along, which is ask questions. So if you said that to me, I would say, why? Give me why you would reject the biblical account of creation. Because I want to learn where they're coming from, what's the basis of that. I want to show them that I'm humble enough to listen to them. Um, and w there may be like, like probably they're gonna say something that's going to allow me to put a pebble in their shoe. So if you said, hey, can I still be a Christian? I would say, yeah, absolutely. Your, your salvation is not dependent on your perfect understanding of anything. <laughs> uh, if it were, it would make it a work. And so I wanna be really clear about the gospel when, when I talk about those kinds of things. Um, but then I wanna know, what's your reason for it? If your reason for it is because you think it can't have happened, if you if you believe it because it's essentially would require miracles to be true, then I'm going to say, all right, wait a minute, what is it to be a Christian? Well, then they might say, be a better person, and I'm going to talk about how that's not what Christianity is. But they might say, well, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead. And then I'm going to say, okay, so you believe that God became flesh and died and then rose from the dead, but you can't believe that God supernaturally created the, the world in the way that Genesis says. Why would you take one and not the other? Because I want them to think about that potential conflict. Not because I'm trying to make them buy into a literal interpretation of Genesis as central. I just want them to understand the slippery slope aspect of it. And then one last thing, I don't know we only got 10 or 12 minutes, so let me get it in before class ends, is that just your thoughts on this. When someone's investigating Christianity, when it comes to conversions, you know, people from unbeliever to believer, do you think more people, it's hard to know, uh, approach Christianity from an intellectual ascent or more from like a childlike faith, you know, Lee Strobel, what he went through, you know, he investigated Christianity. Or do you think most conversions, they don't need all this, that it's more of a, you know, Jesus put a child's head. Like, I think actual Jesus conversion has nothing to do with intellectual ascent. Okay. The intellectual ascent that we're tackling in the class is again about 
kind of addressing objections that lead people to try to push off the Holy Spirit, right? So uh, I, I think actual conversions take place only by a, a work of the Holy Spirit that m could probably better fit the model of childlike faith that you're talking about as opposed to, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. I'm going to believe those things. Um, I will say, though, that I read a statistic yesterday that 65% of Americans claim to be Christians and only 6% have what this researcher defined as a biblical worldview. That to me sounds like it has some interesting implications for your question. Um, you could interpret that as, oh, well, you know, all these people have this childlike faith that doesn't require these things, but I actually interpret it the other way, that actually there's a whole lot of people who are only uh, believing or not believing in Christianity based on their own sort of rational, hey, I like this and I don't like this kind of thing, and they're rejecting the core gospel message. Or culture. Yeah, and so... Which helps explain why yeah. churches are empty, helps yeah. explain why people have a hard, Christians have a hard time with the yeah. biblical worldview, yeah. because we want to be like, I mean, I'm sorry. But no, that's right. I do want to get to this one, because this is kind of the heart of the thing, but yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate that, guys. Um, but 22 is really kind of the heart of the lesson today. So arguably the best position to take on Jonah or Elijah or Balaam's donkey is I take those seriously because Jesus took them seriously. Um, I have no biblical reason to assume that those accounts are figurative unless there's something like I think you can go through Psalms and you can see very clearly there's some figurative language going on in there. There's no reason to like, you know, if, if it says... God stretches out the heavens. I think that could be a reference to the fact that the universe is expanding, but I don't think there's any reason that you have to think God's literally taking some physical thing and pulling it apart the way that you do with your bed sheets or whatever. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a second thing I would say. And then the mountain of evidence for God's existence proves that miracles are possible. So if, you're, if your problem with, again, parts of the Old Testament is the miracles, um, I think there's every reason for us to go, I think the miracles in the Old Testament are reasonable to believe because God exists and has shown himself through verifiable miracles. The view that Jesus uh, had of the Old Testament is the best reason to embrace the 39 books of God, God's word. Here are some others. This is the part I was saying because the heart of it. So real quickly, um, the actually we have more than 10 minutes because that clock is wrong let me see what our actual timeline is 11 minutes, right, 11 minutes. <laughs> the old testament consistently points at jesus the promise of the savior starting in genesis 3 to the typology of the passover lamb to the prophetic words in isaiah 53 and everywhere in between you have jesus 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 throughout the old testament this is an image we use at faith in, in our classes. We call it a bow tie. And it's, it's this emphasis that both Testaments point to Jesus. Another reason to take the high view of the Old Testament, more specifically the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah, or prophesies about the Messiah in ways that it's, uh, make it obvious that Jesus is the fulfillment of it. Um, and again, this is the main reason why some people say, yeah, I, actually my faith is linked so much in the Old Testament because of this prophesying that, that Jesus clearly fulfills. The Old Testament gives us some of the most important foundations of our understanding of the Trinity. Okay, So this is more of a specific area. But even if you start off in Genesis and you say, well, let us make man in our image, singular, you've got right out of the gate uh, this reference to God's try personal nature. Uh, another reason to take a high view of the Old Testament is that uh, one of the better secondary reasons to overall trust the Bible is its diversity and unity or unity and diversity. So the overall trust in Scripture, again, which you can say, you know, God gave me this gift of faith. I'm just going to take it as God's word because someone told me this Bible over here is God's word. That's fine. But one of the sort of intellectual reasons to sit back and say, whoa, 
this really has to be of God is because there are 66 books by over 40 authors in three languages on three continents over 1500 years and yet it still all points to the gospel like in this unified way and so when you if you dismiss the Old Testament you lose some of that okay um, by comparison the Quran is just like one book of the Bible that's the that's the length and scope of the Quran is like one single text instead of 66 books the Old Testament gives us uh, a more complete picture of our relationship to God um, how did we get here? What are, our, what are our origins? Why did we need a savior? The fall of man, right? Uh, what are God's expectations for man? As we talked about before, if you just read the Old Testament, there are some aspects of that that would seem almost nonsensical. The Old Testament gives us this whole path of how God has interacted with man throughout history. More specifically, uh, there's that history of God's mercy, right? Um, the New Testament says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, what does that mean if you don't have a sense of the time, right? You could just say, oh, well, at the right time. Okay. But it's, it, the full meaning of that has much more texture to it when you recognize that there is a plan that God has been working through, um, that he has been pointing to different things with a goal in mind of bringing Jesus into the flesh at a point in history for a purpose <coughs> and, and a specific uh, time. More specific than that even, the account of the flood shows us just the wrath we deserve, right? So one of the things that I think helps me understand God's incredible mercy is when I recognize that if he were to deal with us as we actually deserve, this is what it would look like, right? It would look like the catastrophe of the flood. It would look like us jumping through a bunch of hoops like the animal sacrifice system, right? That we would just constantly be doing to try to make ourselves righteous. That's how God could deal with us. And when you see, all right, I've given you a taste of what that would look like, and now I'm giving you the real answer. Jesus dying for your sins on the cross. I think that only makes sense if you understand the Old Testament. Um, okay, so that, actually, I do have some additional slides, but anybody have any other, here's why I trust the Old Testament, other than just the Bible says that I believe it, which we've covered? I just remember a professor at the seminary, of course he was an Old Testament professor, you know, mm -hmm. I really love the Old Testament, mm -hmm. but... He held up the Hebrew Bible, and then he held up a Greek Bible. And he said, brothers, we dare not neglect the Old Testament. It's two-thirds of Scripture, obviously. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah mm -hmm. uh, it compromises most of Scripture, actually. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know if it's a Lutheran thing, you know, probably more than I do. It's, you know, finding Jesus in the Old Testament and in, in, in the New. I don't know if that started with us or somebody before Luther, but that was a... I don't know if it was a law of gospel thing, but that was a real insight, I think, to helping us. Jesus is all over the scriptures. Yeah. Even in the old, you got to look for him, though. Yeah. There. I don't know where that's and going. that actually takes at least two major paths, too. So there's the typology kinds of stuff, the Christology, where you can see, oh, this three days over here, or this sacrifice here. Like, you can see all those kinds of things, you know, Abraham and Isaac, and all those those sorts of things but there's also times when um, <clears throat> there are references in the Old Testament to the angel of the Lord and you see things happening there that don't seem consistent with a mere angel they seem like there's something more going on there right Jacob wrestling uh, those those kinds of things and there are folks that have gone through, and I, I would say I'm, I'm definitely coming to this view that's, that would say, yeah, almost every time this angel of the Lord phrasing is used, that's actually Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus. You know, Abraham having the conversation with God about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, an is, angel who's he talking to? to right. Make those right, right. And I just I think that's really fascinating. Um, one thing that I did add on here that I didn't put on your sheet is that I, I do think that some people have a tendency to misuse the Old Testament. 
that's a little bit of a concern for me. Um, and and I'm, I have a couple here, two, two things to, to hit on since we have a little bit of time. One is a misunderstanding of the difference between the moral, civil, and ceremonial law in the Old Testament. That, that causes some conflict, especially between Christians. The moral law is exactly what it sounds like, this, this actual right and wrong in our behavior. That's given to all people in all times and all places. The civil law is something given specifically to the people of Israel to run their nation. And the ceremonial law is a set of things that God gave them to set them apart so that it would be obvious this is where the Messiah is coming from. So this is where you get things like don't eat shellfish, um, don't don't wear two kinds of uh, thread in the same cloth. Washing the dishes, uh, and keeping them separate. Well, washing the dishes, I think, may have a, a little bit a, additional m meaning, but um, yeah, exactly with the milk. That's a that's a good example. So those that's an important distinction to make and a lot of people say well how do you know how do you know the difference because if you've never heard this before for some people it sounds like oh well you just have some things in the old testament that you don't like so you're going to say that it's civil or ceremonial law so that you can say it was only for the people of israel not for christians and i i think there's a really simple way to understand it the moral law is repeated and clarified in the new testament the civil and ceremonial law is not. In fact, it's usually like clarified the other direction. Like, you know, like Peter's dream about, you know, there's no longer anything unclean uh, is a reference to both the Gentiles themselves, but also I think to the, those ceremonial laws. And so um, that's a big thing. So like, for example, sex outside of God's plan for sex is still forbidden under the moral law. Um, but the punishments in the ceremonial law are not uh, reinforced in the New Testament. In fact, Jesus had, does some things to show that's not the way, that's not how we're operating on these things anymore. Mm. Second big way that I sometimes see the Old Testament misused is that they can be used to cherry pick false theologies. Uh, theology of glory is one of these. Prosperity gospel is another one. If you want to do a deep theology dive, you can look into those two things uh, more. But I'll tell you, the theology of glory is this emphasis on the Christian life is about me becoming a better and better person, which points you away from the cross, right? So it's not that you shouldn't try to become a better and better person, but if that becomes your central theology, now you're no longer theology of the cross, you're theology of self. Right, do it and so I can, yeah, I can choose a lot of verses from the Old Testament that, that would support this idea, but I have to take them out of context to do it, and I have to misunderstand the rest of the Bible to do that. Prosperity gospel teaches <laughs> that God's primary interest is your material prosperity. Right, God is just seeking to bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. And if he's not blessing you, you must be doing something wrong. That's kind of the way this works, right? And so if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm recommending a, a YouTube video here. The rest of you, if you wanted me to send you this link, I can do that. Uh, if I remember, I might just do it anyway. But it's another Lutheran satire video. And it is hilarious. So it's hilarious and it's sad because it's taking these quotes from Joel Osteen, who you'll sometimes hear referred to as America's pastor, which is so cringy, because he doesn't teach the gospel. He doesn't teach anything about sin and our need for Jesus as our savior. He doesn't, he, he misses the entire point of Christianity, but he says things like this, call out the seeds of greatness. God doesn't want you to stay where you are. He has new levels for you. And the backdrop here of this image <laughs> is martyrs, right? The, the, the suffering of, so imagine saying to one of the early Christian martyrs, just, just be a more positive version of yourself, you know? <laughs> just wash away the negativity and, or here's another one. Don't let negative voices talk you into me mediocrity. You were created for greatness. And imagine saying that to, you know, Peter upside down on the cross. Don't let negative voices talk you into mediocrity, Peter. You were created for greatness. You know. Do you know what his dad believed? No, I don't know. Because didn't he follow what his dad? I, his I'm not aware of that. Yeah. I don't know. His dad was a preacher too. Was he a, a prosperity? 
Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but I didn't know it was Yeah. Or rise up, say, this is my time, this is my moment. I've let excuses, I mean, again, envision someone being burned at the stake and, and Joel Osteen saying, you know, this is your time, this is your moment. Uh, you've let excuses hold you back long enough. Um, if, in fact, this prosperity gospel is the true gospel, then wh- how did that play out for arguably the most devout Christians of all time? Who it sounds more like a self-improvement. Yes. And, and there's a place for that, right? Like, that, you know, the, 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 there's certainly Christians don't want to deny. Like, you could take every single thing Joel Osteen says, I'll bet, that are like these anyway and say, those are valuable insights. We agree. Stop being negative. Think about the positive. Count your blessings. We would agree with all those things, but that's his entire theology. You know that that that's and and that uh, arguably there are lots of problems with it. Mainly, it, it it avoids the true gospel, but it's also I think potentially harmful to someone in the moment. In that, well, what does that mean for me if I'm suffering? Does that mean I'm not a real Christian? Does that mean God doesn't really love me? Does that what does that mean for me? Right, and so. Uh, Those are some potential issues. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Old Testament. We thank you that you have um, shown us your mercy over and over and over and over again throughout the history of the Old Testament and that you have given us so many things that point to our salvation through Jesus. Uh, We thank you for the prophets and for all of those who went before us Um, that you used in important ways, but who often suffered through through those roles. We thank you uh, for the gift that you gave to us through them. And we ask that you continue to help us to have a deeper understanding of you and your word. And we ask that you bless our time in worship today. Feed us with your uh, word and sacrament. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you all. Yeah, there was a movement a long time ago about the prayer.